Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are Kevin McCarney, author and founder of Poquito Mas Restaurants, and journalist, author, Susan Orlean. Author, entrepreneur, businessman, Kevin McCarney grew up in, in Hollywood. He went to Valley College, and while he was deciding what to do with his life, I assume um, he needed some place to work. So he was a janitor, a switchboard operator, uh, a waiter, a trainer, all these things until he soon decided um, what to do. And his brilliant idea was a chain of restaurants called Poquito Mas. But Kevin, Kevin McCarney, Poquito Mas, Mexican, does it all go together? Well, you, you know, it's, I get that quite a bit. It, <laughs> it, it just comes down to the fact that Irish food doesn't really sell that well <laughs> right. in, in, in L.A. Um, and so, what is it, right? <laughs> and I just, I, I, I love Mexican food. I think uh, I've spent so much time in Mexico and I just love that I love the people and I just, you know, there's just so much flavor there. I know. This is, uh, the success of this um, led you to be a lecturer at, at USC, at UCLA, places that you never went to school, right? And here you are teaching classes there. Well, I, the, 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 the programs that I've spoken for are really entrepreneur classes, uh, uh -huh. MBAs, and uh, they want to find out mostly the mistakes that I've made, <laughs> you know, and, and making sure that they don't make those same mistakes. But what you learn in business is no matter how much you know going in, uh, there's still an awful lot to, to learn uh, uh, by road, by, by being there. So what, what does that lecture take? Uh, how does it take form? It, you know, it, it really comes down to the story of Poquito Mas, a 600 oh. square foot restaurant uh, building that was, had a for lease sign in it. And, you know, every entrepreneur looks at a for lease sign like a, 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 a pot of gold. It's like, I could do something with this space. <laughs> right. I can do something with that. And that's really how it starts. And I just kind of go through the evolution of, you know, the first or the second and, and, and show people that it's, um, it's not overnight. You know, I know, but in, how did you know you could do something? Had you been working at other things before I'd, that? I've been in the people business all my life. That's uh, right. But that's not making tortillas. No, I, I worked uh, for... Uh, a bunch of different uh, restaurant chains, the Velvet Turtle, you may have heard of oh, them. Oh, you did. Uh, and I worked, in the, I worked in the corporate industry for a long time, in the I 80, see. 90 hour weeks, and the, you know, and uh, wearing a suit and training people and doing different I things, see. and finally decided, you know what, uh, I'm actually gonna go out on my own because I, I wanted to work for myself. Well, then that gives you the background. You put your time in yes. as far as knowing what to do in the restaurant business. Yes. So you, you knew a little bit, but did you know how to make uh, chili verde? Yeah, <laughs> I've I've been in love with food uh, all my life, and and I spent a lot of time in Mexico, and especially in little towns in Mexico, talking to different people about recipes and things like that. Oh, so, you did absolutely. There's San Felipe and Loreto are two of my favorite spots on the on this earth. So do you speak Spanish? I uh, see, I do, but uh, do you have to? I. I of course you have to, but you know my my uh, my grammar is so much better. My I should say my accent is so much better than my grammar. Oh yes, you know, so oh, your accent is good. <laughs> yeah, so it can get me get me in trouble once in a while. Um, the the thing is, it's this fifteen million dollar. Uh, is it is are those yeah, right I mean, numbers? Yeah, it's it's a well, it's, it's twelve restaurants right now. Okay, yeah. And so it's it's doing. You know, we've is it uh, just in L.A.? Just pretty much in the L.A. area. I've got two wonderful daughters and a wonderful wife. I like to spend time with them. I'm, I'm in no hurry to, to match Starbucks for numbers of units. Oh, so this, it's much better, especially if you've worked in the business. You know what you can control, mm -hmm. right? You know how large you can go. Yeah, I, and I, I think that what I really learned is I, I love the people that I'm working with. 
I've got people that have been with me for 22, 25 oh. years. Is that is it that old? That uh, long? Yeah, you've 27 had years ago. Oh, uh, wow. And I love the food and I love the customers. I, like, I love the customers <coughs> that come in because they're really receptive to what we've been doing. One thing um, that, that I read is that you invented a tortilla machine. Yeah, I invented a tortilla, a corn tortilla press actually. That, a that, press. That is a, um, we patented it. It's just for forming the corn tortilla perfectly every time. Just that little, the small size. Yes. But uh, it, said, it, it said you had multiple patents. What does that mean? It means that there's one patent, uh, there's three different types of the, of the machine. There's a foot press one where you, you don't have to use your hands at all. You can push your foot down and it'll form the tortilla. And there's another one that's a hand press model and there's a much larger one that can do huaraches. So that's multiple. Those are different aspects of this tortilla machine. That's correct. How long did it take you to invent it and why? You know, why? Because I wanted to be able to do a great corn tortilla from scratch every day at so all the So you mix stores. the maza and all Absolutely. that? Absolutely. We mix everything. And I think that uh, that's why I, I want to do it. I want, I, I, wanted that, I wanted that fresh corn tortilla. Okay, so you got that fresh corn tortilla. And 27 years later, you write The Secrets of Successful Communication. Tell us how the book came about. Um, again, I've been in the people business. And the one thing I noticed was a, a sort of a, a different pattern in the way people interacted with each other and the way they responded or reacted. And so I've distilled a lot of what's happening in communication down to some pretty simple concepts. The big brain being up here, the thinking brain that's going to say the right thing at the right time every time. And then the little brain, which is right next to the mouth, and that's going to spit out the wrong thing at the wrong time, usually in front of the wrong person. That's the, that's the one that can get us in trouble. And that you've seen well, firsthand. <laughs> for, firsthand, we, we've experienced it, uh, and I'm probably guilty of little brain activity once in a while myself. Big, big brain, um, the premise of the book, big brain, little brain, uh, you dedicated it to your mom, Absolutely. who has a big brain. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Did you uh, learn a lot from her? She, you know, we grew up, um, uh, we were motel kids in Hollywood. You know, we grew up in motels and we didn't have a lot of money. And so we were always uh, looking for, you know, another you know, uh, meal and things like that. And my mom was always, always kept us thinking, you know, that, that uh, always don't blame anybody, take responsibility. Uh, the words that come out of your mouth belong to you, and you have to be the one to drive your life uh, to be a better place, and, and don't blame others. Was she a single mom? No, she was. In, inevitably, she was a single mom because my father drank a lot. Oh, so she, So we're back to the, yeah, the Irish thing that we say. Yes, the Irish thing. Seven kids. Uh, that many? Seven and kids. And moving she was, from room to room like that? Yeah, she was a full-time nurse. Uh, oh, and she so was. She, she was always working. So she kept you together. Absolutely, but she always had a great attitude. She always had a great response, no matter what was happening. She always found the right words to say, and so I, I really I attribute it to her. She sounded like the inspiration, she like an inspiration. Def absolutely, definitely one of the inspirations. She was a wonderful woman. The book is broken into four parts: um, big brain, little brain, are two parts, right? Legacy and seven. Um, the seven, uh, I, I would, I call them the seven opportunities. Or you know, seven in a, in a lessons. Moment, and eventually the, the seven principles. So we've talked about big brain. You, you have to say the right thing. How do you get yourself to think that way? Well, what we did in the book is we tried to uh, lay out some different ideas with tools for the big brain that your big brain can, can recognize and use frequently. And also we identify a lot of different traps that the little brain oh, I love can that. get into. Yeah, you talk about tools and traps. Yeah. And what are, like, uh, one tool would be? Well, uh, one tool would be uh, 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 using the correct tone. You yes, know? right, you talk about I tone. I think the tone is the message. You can say the same words in a different tone, but it can mean something totally different if you use a different tone. And, and I think that's critical. The tone is the message. And as far as traps go, uh, there's many of them, but one of them is assuming the negative. Somebody comes in and says something to you that, you know, oh, that's right. like, oh, I'm assuming you assume the negative about what they're saying instead of giving them a chance to sort of speak it out and, and hear what they have to say. So we trap ourselves and we trap them as well. Exactly. We that's don't... a great point. It's a, that's really uh, absolutely true. And, and, you know, there's a couple of what we call uh, activators. I call them activators, uh, things that in our lives, there's sometimes there are certain people that will activate us. 
you know, during the holidays, it could be a relative. It could be that uncle who always tells that embarrassing story of you from years ago. And you don't want to see him, really. You don't want to see him, so he'll, you, you, you know, you don't want to be around him. So, you, you know, uh, and then you've got different things in traffic. If somebody's, you know, oh, yes. you're, you're in a hurry, you know, you're under a time pressure. And the person in front of you isn't making that left as fast as you want them to. And you, you start going for your horn. Well, if, as soon as you go oh. for your horn, realize that's a signal that you might be in a little brain mode. Don't do that. Right. Don't that's do that. little brain mode. Okay, I got it. I got it. Um, one of the things that you talked about was an encounter. And I think you saw these at the restaurants yes. on several occasions. And w w were you taking notes all the time while you were, I <laughs> while you I, were I working? <laughs> I still am. You know, I, I still am. I, you know, um, the, the encounter I think you were talking about is like a, a lady that walked into a restaurant and um, was really upset because <laughs> she didn't like the enchiladas and came back and oh, slapped them on know. the Oh, I know. That was horrible. And, and then, she, you know, she comes back again after we got a new one, slams them down. And then she comes back... Uh, uh, again, and so the manager finally said, "I'll give you anything on the menu you want, just to please her." And he went overboard, and and after making three orders and, and gave it to her, and realized she wasn't um, eating anything, and he really wanted to go back and speak to her, but he was really had just done some big brain training on this. Oh, and, he had. He was. Oh, yeah. He right. done he done some big brain training with us, and so what he did is he just offered her anything. She came back before she left and she put her hand uh, uh, on his arm. She said, you know, thank you. And the manager was perplexed because he had just been angry three or four right. times. <laughs> Poor and she thing. said, thank you for not getting angry at me. Uh, I just came from the hospital. My husband's not doing well. Um, I haven't slept in days. I, I didn't mean to take it out on you. And you know, that's gonna happen to people. That's gonna happen. People come in if they're, you know, uh, uh, angry or you know, you, somebody you, you can see that's obviously very upset it's not always because of anything you're doing or you're saying. It could be something else happening in their life. This kind of that pressure that can kind of put them to say things that they wouldn't normally say. Yeah, she wouldn't have but said that. But we don't understand it when it's happening. It's tough, and that's what I try to do in the book: is make it easy for people to recognize it. Because if you can recognize when you you know some people don't even get um, are, are stuck in the same position at a job all their life because they don't recognize this pattern they fall into of using their little brains and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Oh, no. And and so they, they, they get frustrated and they and, and, it, and, it, and it comes out even more. So if they learn how to recognize the patterns that, that, that uh, are pretty well laid out, I think that they'll be able to realize, oh, you know what, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to fall into that little brain trap. I'm going to look for a big brain tool here. You talked about big brain training. Do you actually have training courses at we, your restaurants? Yes, uh, my <coughs> restaurants, absolutely. We do training courses, and we've been asked by others to do them. I haven't yeah. established that yet. That's an interesting thing because that, I think, puts your management in tune with what's going on, right? Absolutely. And, you know, in our business, the number one thing is we want the customer to come back. Thank you so much for being with us today. Joan, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Susan Orlean. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with journalist, author, uh, and mother, Susan Orlean, who was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. She graduated from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and then moved to Portland, Oregon. She's a staff writer at The New Yorker, and among her writings, you'll remember uh, her books, The Orchid Thief, which I couldn't put down, The Bullfighter uh, Checks Her Makeup, my kind of place, and the latest one is Rin Tin Tin. Susan's in Los Angeles from the East Coast where she has another passion, teaching creative writing at NYU. She's here also to talk to the West Side Center for Independent Living. They're holding their annual literary tea and she will be talking about her new book, Rin Tin Tin. Some of the women who have worked at the West Side Center for years are Ruth March, our friends, Betty Deutsch, Ruth Kraft, Louise Esco, and they have been helping seniors find a place for independent living as well as people who are disabled. So we're thrilled that you're here and that you're going to be talking to them. Oh, thanks. I'm really looking forward to it and, and very impressed by their work. 
Do you do a lot of charity work? I do as much as I can. And in fact, in the course of working uh, on this book tour with Rin Tin Tin, I've used that opportunity to oh. promote um, donations to animal shelters. Oh, that's nice. So that's been a nice occasion. I've had a number of the dog rescue groups come and in some cases bring dogs <laughs> to the readings, which has made everybody very happy. Do they all look like Ren Tin Tins? Well, either either they do in real life or they think they do, they which think is they more do. Uh, probably just as important. But Susan, I have to go back. I did I did love the orchid thief. Yes. Oh, it was just fantastic. And how did it feel when it was made into a movie adaptation? Did you work with Meryl Streep? I only met with her after she was done shooting the part. Oh, so she, you did I didn't work with her. She had decided that she wanted to create the character without being overly influenced by meeting me. So I was at first disappointed, but then understood that um, she wanted to create the character in a, in a somewhat different way. And then we became friends after she had shot her part and we had a chance to spend oh, time together. Because she's a great New Yorker. And she she's is. A, goes to all the literary events that go on in New York, yeah. Well, as I said, I loved it so much I couldn't put it down. I oh, just thought it was you. like, and like who would think you're writing, a, writing and reading about orchids and stealing little plants and that kind of thing. But when you left Michigan with honors, you went to Portland, Oregon. What were you gonna do there? I was basically <laughs> biding my time until what I thought was inevitable, and that was my descent into law school. This had been oh. what my parents wanted me to do, oh. and they felt that it was the proper thing for a girl with a degree in English to, to do. <laughs> to, to do something. <laughs> in spite of the fact that I had said to my parents with no, no holds barred that I had no interest in being a lawyer. But my father felt that was the thing you should do. Go get a law degree. You'd always have something to fall back on. And that's true. Now it was a law degree. In my day, it was a teaching degree. Mm -hmm. We've gone up a little bit, which is great for women. Well, now I think that's true. <laughs> Although now I'm beginning to wonder if it's a law degree. I, I assume it has to be something else, like computer programming. Yeah, but exactly. I came out to Portland. Um, my sister was living in Portland. Oh, and that's I, how. Okay. I, I went out to... Uh, adventure a little bit and spend that year doing I didn't really know what but I got a writing job which of course had been my dream it was what I really wanted to oh, do. Oh it was oh so that's how your career path started you it, got a job there? It was a very lucky piece of timing which was a small magazine had begun they were looking for uh, writers, and I went into the interview and I said, you simply have to hire me <laughs> because this is all I've ever really wanted to do, and I'm not gonna leave here without you promising me that you're gonna give me this job. I think they were impressed by my enthusiasm. I think you should have gone to law school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was evidently very persuasive, yeah, so I, mean. I could have been a litigator. But <laughs> that's what I mean. It, it was. Uh, I loved the job, and I knew immediately that what I wanted was to be a writer. So that started your career path. Totally different than what you had really gone to Portland thinking about. Yes, although I always had wanted to be a writer, and. Certainly my parents were worried that I'd be a waitress because well. and you'd be sitting around dreaming about being a writer and you simply had to pay the bills. Well, let's talk about that, that persuasiveness of yours. Once you started writing, you followed this little path to the New Yorker, which is the literary spot for, for writers to be. And you've been there for quite some time. It, once I started writing, um, I shared the dream that many writers have, which was that I would end up at The New Yorker. Oh, and you did? And it that's... was my hope against all hope because certainly it was impossible to figure out how it would be achievable. But I began writing with that as my 
my model. That, I was going to say, is that, is that what you teach in your classes too? To... Definitely. I mean, I think that that represents the best tradition of nonfiction that, that we have. And if you want to learn about non, nonfiction writing, all you need to do is look back at the history of The New Yorker and, and you will get well educated in the form. Very well, very well written. Things that draw you in. Mm -hmm. Is it? Does it have a lot to do with the editors? Definitely. Because it's a style, right? There, yes, although in a funny way, it has to do with the editor's decision always to let the uh, writers follow their passions. I see, I see. Well, in following your passions, the books that we talked about before, um, did, did they come out of articles that you had written for the... The Orchid Thief did. I had gone to report the story, and when I came <clears throat> back, I said, I will write the story, but I want to do a book about this. Oh, so I you think knew. And then what about The Bullfighter? The Bullfighter is a collection of pieces. I so see. It, it was an anthology of uh, profiles that I'd written. Uh, and really, the same with my my place. Yeah, it? my kind of place was also a collection of pieces that were really more about place rather than about people. And had they been in the magazine before? Yes, uh, some I had see, been I in the see. most had been in the New Yorker. Some were in uh, some of the other magazines I've written for. So, so the the main uh, piece that could become a film was the the Orchid Thief because that was about a specific. It wasn't a collection. Right, exactly. It was a story. Although one of my pieces in uh, The Bullfighter Checks Her Makeup was made into a film also. Oh, it was? What was and that? It was, uh, the film is called Blue Crush. Uh -huh. And it was based on a story I'd written um, called Surf Girls of Maui. Oh, wow. So now we're to Rin Tin Tin. We're from the surfers to the dogs. Right. How did we get to him? Did you write a short thing on that? No, I didn't. It was... Uh, <laughs> so now we're turning the thing. Yes, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> I happened to just stumble onto his name in the course of working on another story. It brought back so many memories, but it also made me very curious. And I thought, well, what, who was Rinton Tin? You know, I, I knew who he was. I'd grown up dreaming of having a German Shepherd, but I really knew nothing about him. So I began doing a little research out of, purely out of curiosity. And the next thing I knew, I said to my agent, I'm writing a book about this. And what, how, how did you think you could write about him? Was there enough research? Was there enough for you to feel that you had a handle on it? Yes, definitely. I, I knew that, um, I found out early on that the papers and archives that related to his history were mostly intact and that I could <clears throat> spend what turned out to be many years digging through those archives. Oh, it was? How and, long was it? Well, it took me over seven years to oh, write the book. Oh, you've been working on, so you're working on it in between doing other things? Or yes, you, yeah. yes. <laughs> and then for the last uh, two years, I was just working on the book. But weren't there other Rin Tin Tins? Yes, this is the story of the original Rin Tin Tin and then the oh, um, entire legacy that continues to this day. Are they imposters, would you say? Or no, do they, no. They're not imposters. No, no they they're are. They're real Rin Tin Tins? They are real Rin Tin Tins beginning with the first Rin Tin Tin and then his son and his grandson oh. and subsequent dogs. Oh, that kind of legacy. A real legacy. So you call him Rin Tea? Yes. Like, like well, Rin I prefer calling him Rin Tin Tin. It sounds more dignified. Yes, but it does. But Rin Tin was kind of funny. That was I his ni his nickname was Rin Tin. <laughs> and then you talked about Lee Duncan. And Lee was the the real heart of the book. Lee Duncan was the man who found Rin Tin, the original Rin Tin Tin on a battlefield in World War One in France, and brought him back to Los Angeles where he lived. And then began thinking, you know, my dog is really special. I think he could make it in the movies. Well, how could he do that? In training in what way? Just regular dog training? 
he trained him to uh, respond to a million different commands and to do things that while they were within the realm of a dog's possibility, they were not typical. He could climb trees, he could untie ropes, he could jump over practically any fence, he could play dead, he could look as if he were injured. He, he was very talented. So you, you talk about this as not really being a dog story, but a story of life, of bonding, of uh, what else, family? It's also very much a story of memory and, and also of our devotion to these heroic figures, whether it's a dog, a person, that a superhero. Interesting, because you do go into the training of dogs and you talk about popular breeds. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was so interesting is if you look at the history of dogs in American culture, it gives you a real sense of what else was going on in American culture at the time. Oh. Which breeds were popular, reflects very much what was going on with the population of Americans. Oh. What, what dogs appealed to us at different times is very representative of what else was going on in culture. So, you, so your part of your research was that, the, the culture of the times? Very much. You know, was it, it easy to find that about dogs? Well, yes and no. I mean, there were <laughs> surprising gaps in some of that history. Um, simply finding out which dogs were popular at, in different eras was not easy. Finding out in 19... 48, right. which were the most popular breeds. I know. How do you do that? Well, do you see the, pictures of women caring for their dogs? Yeah. Does no, that help? It, it, it <laughs> helps in terms of seeing what dogs were very present in, in pop culture, in advertising, in movies. But for the real numbers, you have to sit down and look at breed registration oh. and figure it out according to some of the historical <coughs> material that the American Kennel Club has. And, oh. But it's not, as, it's not as extensive as you would imagine. Oh my gosh, I didn't think about that. You had all that, those records to go through. So that would give you a, a light into what you were doing. Yeah, and they were fascinating. I had never really done a lot of historical research before, but I realized how, how much you can learn by looking at records and archives and um, compiled statistics from different periods. Well, I'm so excited that you were here today because now I have a new book to start. I'm Along I'm my delighted. other ones because I love your writing so much. And before we leave, did he have a double? Did he have someone come in this, and double for this, him? This is a disputed fact, so <laughs> I will say no comment. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It's great to talk to you. And keep writing. Email me at jaquinn1aol.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.